right. So where do we start, Ben? I think the first question everyone's going to ask is when are property prices going to appreciate by 30 to 50 percent again? That's, 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 we oh, want to know yeah. right before that starts so we can buy. That's, yeah. that's, we'll the, buy. that's get, get your time machine, go back to late 2020. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, hey, man, so you've put out, um, we, we reference your stuff a lot. You, you know, the, the, the data you put out, huge fans, you know, I th we think it's awesome. And uh, you put out some graphs around, you know, we, we look at numbers, we're ne we never put them together in like nice visuals the way you do it. But the stuff you put, or it, you put out around the single family home numbers, this is mm -hmm. something that to me seems like a very big deal because I think the, the real estate, well, the real estate landscape, if we're kind of looking at it from an investor view, you know, was where we look at it more, but I think it's changing almost permanently because I don't like, we're, you know, there's housing starts and we know we have this population growth and stuff, but these single family numbers, because they haven't moved in so long with the population growth, like th these things are just going to become what we're calling like the unicorns in the future, because they're just, we're not, I don't see it turning around any, like, are we missing something here where those starts are really going to start drastically changing again? Yeah. So let me unpack that a little bit. So what we're talking about for the folks who, Maybe um, you'll you'll put on a chart, I assume, over yeah, time. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to throw yeah. it up, yeah. Oh, okay, so um, one of the things that's really striking when we look at kind of the housing-related data is what's happening with building permits. Now, remember that building permits give us a, a view into what's, a, what's going to happen kind of six months down the road with construction activity. And if you look at single-family building permits, They've absolutely collapsed. I mean, spectacular collapse. So in, in Ontario, it's right now we're running at the lowest level since the 1980s. And if you look at in BC, we actually don't have a precedent for how low it is going back. I mean, the data goes back to 1980. We've never been this low. And so I, what's happening there is because you've got interest rates rising, um, it, it's, it's first off, it's impacted the ability for developers to access the financing necessary to, to, to launch new construction projects, but also, and perhaps more importantly, you got to remember that in Canada, like we don't really build on spec the same way that they do in other countries. Like generally, if you're a developer and you want to break ground on a, on a development, the bank's not going to finance you until you can show that you've pre-sold, you know, some threshold, typically 70, 80%. Um, and right now with rates where they are, you know, consumers have kind of pulled back. You can't sell anything pre-construction. There were all these horror stories of people who bought in 2022, 2021. And now when they came to close, they're like, you know, they're deeply underwater. And, and you know, all these horror stories just affect people's psyches. And so consequently, like you look at what's happening right now um, and you kind of extrapolate that into the future. And we're going to have a situation where we have very little new supply for a period of probably a couple of years. And, one of the things that I've been pointing out is, you know, we're in this weird dynamic where, like, let's be honest, interest rates suck. Um, the the housing market, it's really hard to see housing kind of exploding back to the crazy levels of demand until we get this affordability thing figured out. Now, I know we're going to talk about that, and I think sales are going to tick up this spring, but it's not going to be like it was until we get this affordability thing figured out. But at some point, we will. Like, it's, you know, everything is cyclical. And at some point, we're going to get back into a more normal demand environment. And my concern is when that happens, you're going to see demand normalize into a severely supply constrained market. And it sets us up potentially for like a, a supply crisis that makes kind of that 2017 and 2020, 2021 period look potentially tame in comparison. That's my fear. Right. And, and you know, we'll see. But the numbers don't look good right now. Yeah. So, and, and, and for anyone not watching, because a lot of people will just listen to this, the, the numbers that you had here, um, the Canadian numbers for single family building permits, I guess of right around 2005, it was probably about 125, 130,000. And since then, so in the last 20 years, it's just kind of chugged along downwards. I mean, it's been choppy up and down a little bit, but it's, it's down. And, and right now it's down to what's that number? That's probably about 50,000. So it's it's less than it's less than half over the last twenty years, and it's been it's it's been consistently in the down you know in a downtrend. So my, yeah, my... Well, so the, the craziest stat just to jump in there, sorry to interrupt yeah. you, there, Nick, but what like the craziest stat is so when we when we look at um, population growth relative to permits, so through time generally we you know we build one new single family home for every 
uh, four or five people that are out of the population, roughly. Um, and now we're to the point where nationally we're building one new single family home for every 25 people out of the population. Now that's a, you know, that's just a crazy number and that's clearly not sustainable. I know we can talk about population growth. We're kind of at a peak right now where population growth is, is probably at the maximum that we're going to see for a period of time. Um, and so maybe that's a little bit inflated by these crazy population growth numbers, but still it's just not enough. Like it was just, we need to be building more single family. And I know there's also a push for density and I'm all for that. And, and certainly that makes sense. We need to push density, especially around transit lines and stuff like that. But let's be honest, Canadians still aspire to single family home ownership, especially you know, young families that that's still kind of the, you know, the thing that everyone ultimately wants. And um, it's hard not to see that potentially being in shorter supply Again, not immediately, not in the next year, maybe two years while we work our way through this high interest rate environment. But let's remember, this is not a permanent high rate environment. We will go back into, you know, some like the demand is going to normalize at some point. Uh, and and what it, what that supply backdrop looks like uh, when that happens is is kind of a scary question at this point. Here's what, so I, yeah, I agree with everything you're saying. And then I see some, sometimes I think it was BMO that came out. I don't know if it was Douglas Porter or someone else, but I feel like it was, it was one of their reports that said, Canada's building more than enough housing units. And mm -hmm. I was like, well, yeah, but you know, if you look at it like that, like if you look at just the big Canadian number, maybe he had a point, but if you don't look at it in the local, like the specific locations, Toronto, Vancouver, even if you're looking at in some places in Alberta, you're, the the rest of the numbers don't matter so much because they're not getting the same population growth. And then there was no mention of the type of housing as well. I'm like, so it's yeah. like a little bit misguided. Like I was like, yeah, I feel like that's not telling the whole story, you know? Uh, yeah, hundred percent. So, you know, good examples. If we look at, you see, I, 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 you know, I publish this stuff every month. So if you look at what's currently under construction across the country, you see, it looks like a, like a hockey stick where condos are spiking upwards. Rentals are spiking upwards. Like people, a lot of people don't realize we have, pretty meaningful boom in in rental apartment growth right now but if you disaggregate that so if you look at like condos and rentals under construction it's like 70 percent of those are one bedroom right like it's 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 an incredibly high number of them are these relatively small units because that's generally what has been in demand in the rental market for for a period of time um and so you're absolutely right like the the on an, on an absolute unit basis, it looks like we're building a fair bit, but when you actually pull it apart and you look at what we're building, I think you can make the argument that we're not building enough single family and we're arguably building maybe too many one bedroom mm -hmm. condos. And, and then also let's not forget that building permits look forward. So what we're seeing this collapse in building permits are telling us what that's going to look like six months down the road. And so it's going to be worse in, in three and six months. What, um, Here's what I can't get my head around because I can't figure out because I agree with what you're saying and, and it's the affordability that I'm trying to figure out how this comes back because we either need this this growth in it, and I understand I think interest rates will you know normalize someplace from where they are now to where they were but we're still going to need some growth in income which seems harder to come by historically I know it's been a little bit higher recently but historically they, they don't really jump much and unless commodity prices so unless material costs go down which I I feel like the probability of that in a meaningful way is slim to not like, like low labor costs would have to go down. Um, taxes and, and fees would have to go down or land costs would have to go down. And I'm just looking at it. Cause when we talk to builders, they're like, yeah, guys, I have no, like, we're not just not going to build like, like they're just shelving projects as you know, yeah. cause they're just like, well, let's just hold on. Cause we're not going to build it if we can't sell for this price. So where does the gap get closed? Like this is what I can't figure out. The gap has to get closed by some sort of affordability measures because I don't feel like the prices. I mean, I, when I say come down, I mean like they really come down for new construction. I don't mean they drop by a few percentage points, you know, because because some people will call us out yeah. on that. They're like, hey, they went from, you know, a, a million bucks to it's like nine seventy five now. I'm like, okay, that <laughs> you're right. It came down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what did you? Yeah. yeah. So that's what I'm, I'm trying to figure out. Where I don't. I, it doesn't make sense to me. Where, where prices, did? Yeah. Yeah, I, I know where you're going with that. I think um, I think that one of the kind of main fulcrums around new pricing is in land value, and we are seeing land values off substantially. So I actually had dinner with a um, the guy who's kind of a um, well known in the commercial land 
sales area. And um, I mean, he was telling us that they were seeing deals that are like land deals that are selling for 40% below kind of the previous mark. Really? Okay. Um, and that. so that's, yeah, yeah. So, so that's the first thing that tends to get hit is land values. And actually there was a good article, I think it was in the Globe and Mail where they were talking about, um, yeah, a development parcel that just sold for 45% less than it sold for, I think in 2018, like major drawdowns on land. So, you know, there's some wiggle room there. Um, but you're right. Like the, the labor, co- maybe you're going to see some of the trades, you know, for a while their pricing was crazy because you just couldn't get any trade. Well, if the, the if building slows, construction activity slows a little, you probably get more negotiating room on that. Um, but ultimately what needs to change is the taxes, right? Because we know that, you know, 30% of the cost of a new home is various levels of embedded tax, right? And so if the various levels of government can figure out a way to reduce taxes on new construction, it'll, that would move the needle a lot in terms of getting those prices down, right? I just look at um, public- but I hear what you're saying. Like, it's just going to be a grind. In terms of, like, broadly to restore affordability nationally, um, it's just going to be great. It's going to be, it's just going to take time. It's going to, you are, you will need incomes to rise. So it's going to be a multi-year process. And maybe part of that is prices grind sideways. Maybe they grind a little lower in some of the more, more you know, costly metros. Like, I, I don't know, but it's, it's not, it's not going to, we're not going to be here a month from now talking about like restored affordability. This is going to be a multi-year process if we get yeah. there. Okay. I got it. So slowly they chip away because prices aren't, can't move. There's like, the, you know, there, there is a bit of a ceiling on prices because of affordability. So slowly they, it, they, they, the gap narrows and maybe it, it, it catches up a little bit. I didn't, I didn't know that about land. The, the land, the specific land deal you were talking about, was that in the golden horseshoe area somewhere or was yeah, it? Yeah, right in yeah? Toronto. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I was just wrote about it. Let me, um, yeah, well, let me see if I can pull it up while we're talking, but yeah, um, that's... it was in the Globe and Mail. And then, and then, so, and we were talking earlier. So, yeah, why do you pull that up? Because we're seeing a lot of different things in the market as well. And then we're seeing cracks in the market now with because people aren't investing in an environment where things, and I was joking earlier, where, well, I wasn't joking because things were really going up 30 to 50% a year, which blew my mind. Mm-hmm. Remember those charts when it was like, Here's all the cities in in like Ontario where the prices have gone up more than 30 or 35%. And there was like a list of like 25 different places. <laughs> like it was nuts. Oh, it's crazy. Um, but you are seeing kind of some stress in the market now because that's not happening, because carrying costs and interest rates are higher and things are kind of breaking down in some places. And we had, um, you know, we were just speaking with someone that was telling us that they there were, you know, they see, they were looking at some paperwork that it looks like there's a couple more things coming down the pipe where they feel there's going to be some, some private lending that is hurt because mm. of the, you know, some development deals that aren't done or poor investing, that type of thing. You know, when does that, it feels like we're right at that point now, like those things come out and that, is that like a turning point in the cycle? Like once those things get flushed out of the market, it's like, that's the froth stuff that's finally out of the market. And then we move forward from that point a little bit. Yeah, that's a great question. It is interesting how you're starting to see some of these, I don't want to say, let me yeah. change what our, our words yeah. here. Some of this like more aggressive investor behavior, let's say. Some um, things that weren't maybe I, what they were cracked up to be or what they were portrayed as, <laughs> you, you know? Right, right. Clearly not, right? So, you know, you get these, I mean, the big one that broke was this this group of companies with these bizarre names like, you know, the pink flamingo and uh, happy Gilmore and all yeah. that were buying these, um, these, these pretty liquid properties in around Northern Ontario. And, um, you know, I, I, I suspect you guys have seen what I've seen, which is that some of the kind of term sheets on those investment loans were like, you know, first mortgage, hundred percent financing private, right? It's like, who yeah. does that? That's crazy. So, and, you know, and- no buffer, but yeah, and it was at like not a rate that was reflective of the hundred percent financing at all, or the property, or the location. Right. You, if you right. want to do that, and you're getting a whatever a twenty plus percent interest rate because you're taking on a bunch of risk, that's one thing. But if you're you're doing it the equivalent of a eighty percent loan to value starter home in Toronto, you know, at, at yep. that rate, it's it was it was very different, right? Right. Well, exactly. So that that's. You're right, because the, the liquidity in these markets, like how long does it take you to liquidate a portfolio of homes in, again, I mean, you know, like 
Sault Ste. Marie, like how it's good. Timmins, you know what I mean? It's, it's crazy. Um, but at any rate, the thing that was then bizarre was they kind of were representing that, well, yes, you're financing at hundred percent loan to value, but we're also on the side going to raise money to do these renos. And once the renos are done, the actual LTV will be more like 65. It's like, okay, you know, maybe. Um, so then there's like 50, 55 million dollars of promissory notes that were raised and and but then you you see these news reports of these counselors in these cities like levying fines against these these same companies for basically not maintaining these properties and so you know to an observer like myself looking at it you're like well wait a minute you raised all this money via promissory notes to do renovations clearly renovations aren't being done on all these properties because you've got the municipality barking at you guys for basically leaving these properties sitting in, you know, you know, just, just becoming an eyesore. Where did the money go? Right. Yeah. Like, you know, it's inquiring minds want to know. Right. And, and then conveniently you've got all these videos floating around on social media, these people flying private jets and sitting on boats and court side at all these big sporting. And you're just like, well, something doesn't compute. So anyway, bottom line is this is the sort of stuff that shows up when the cycle turns right so it's very easy to kind of paper over aggressive behavior um, and poor investment choices when property prices are going up 10 15 20 30 percent a year right any idiot can make money in that yeah. market well you just buy any it's the market today that brings all those bodies to the surface and then you find it there's that famous saying you find out who's swimming naked when the tide goes out the tide's going out or it has gone out in the last year and a half and now you find out who's swimming naked which is some of these goofballs up in you know timmons yeah, I'm surprised that it took this. Uh, I, I got to be honest, I'm surprised it took this long, because the rates have been up there for a while. So people have been burning through some some cash in these types of scenarios. But I guess if they were sitting on cash and they, they were able to hold on, because it, it hasn't been a short period of time now that the rates have been been high. These, the carrying costs have been higher. No, you're right. So Nick, that's like the, the number one thing that I would say has surprised me is how resilient everything's been. So if you look at mortgage arrears nationally, 17 basis points off a low of like 15, like we're up two basis points, like 0.02%. And um, it's just nothing. And if you look at even like, you know, so I know people say, well, you just wait because as these loans renew, then you'll see all the pain. And I'm sympathetic to that view. Like I'm a, you know, this, these rates have to drive delinquencies higher. They have to, but you're not seeing it. And what's crazy is, so if you look at the, the books of like national bank and Bank of Nova Scotia. Those are the two banks that have the true floating payment variable rate mortgages. So all of their variable rate mortgages have seen payments go up 70, 80, 90%. Um, all the other banks have those static payment. So even as rates rise, the payments stay constant. Do you know what I mean? Until renewal and then they spike. And so, you know, you would assume that you would see a big increase in non-performing loans at National Bank and BNS. Um, we're not. There's the there's no difference between their delinquencies and the other banks. So I'm telling you, it's a total head scratcher where I come down on that topic is I think what we're seeing is first off, we know there was a ton of pandemic related savings, like a ton. The bank of Canada did great work on that. The average Canadian had like eight months of liquid savings, just sitting in basically in cash coming out of the pandemic, which was, you know, they went into the pandemic with like one month and they came out with eight. So there was a lot of cash sitting on the sidelines. And I think part of what we've seen is that that cash cushion has helped buffer the impact of these higher rates. That's one. But then also like the job market's still really strong. Like we've seen unemployment tick up a little, but really like if you're, if you're willing to work, it's, it's, there's still opportunities, right? This is not a recessionary environment. So, you know, I think until we see those things change, I think that rates at these levels, if it stays here for a length of time, you will see those delinquencies rise as that cash cushion gets worn down as the economy starts to weaken. But I'm with you. It's it's shocking to me that we're 18 months, almost two years into this rate hiking cycle. And it's like, there's there's really nothing to, to see, right? Which is, yeah. I wouldn't have expected that. Yeah, especially the Bank of Nova Scotia, because, <clears throat> excuse me, I know that with a lot of brokers, they that was one of their first options for real estate investors because of some of the options yeah. they had available for investors. So if they had a, a larger, and I don't know the numbers, but if they had, part of their book was a larger percentage of investors, I mean, it seems like they, you know, then the investors are still holding on to these properties. And, you know, whether they were 
uh, renting them out at a loss now. So, the, but if the loss is relatively minor for them, so they're just burning through some capital and they're okay holding on to it, or or there's something else. It's uh, that one, yeah, that one's surprising. And then we have the pop. You know, it's interesting. So here's an interesting anecdote for you. This, um, so I, I was speaking at your conference. When was that? A year ago? A year? Into- yeah, last. Uh, what May? When, when did we do that? Yeah, I think it was spring last year. Yeah, last spring sometime. <laughs> And it was just interesting talking to everybody afterwards. So I you know, gave a presentation and then chatted with everyone. And, um, you know, the, the stories everyone was telling me was just like, yeah, my interest rate's gone up a lot. I'm, you know, pretty cash flow negative, but yeah, I've got all these savings over here and I've got lots of equity. So maybe I can, you know, if I need to, I could tap the equity. And it kind of gave me some insight that like, even for people that maybe are seeing challenging financial circumstances, they still have lots of options. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I mean? They can tap equity. They can sell one property and keep the others or whatever. Um, maybe that explains some of it that we just had so much equity because of the run up in house prices too. Like it's hard to default on a loan if you've got, you know, $200,000 of equity in it. Right. You got options. I, I definitely think it matters because it, it went so fast and, and yeah, it came back down from the peak. I know it's come back down a bunch, but Depending on the segment of the market, it's it's it it, it hasn't gone back. The prices haven't gone back too. I, I don't mean uh, they haven't come down. I mean they haven't. If you like, I mean, if you've been investing for just a few years, you're sitting mm-hmm. on equity still, and I you know the a lot of people. Be, if they're if they're not, their numbers really aren't too bad because rent prices have offset a lot of those increases. Because we've we've played yeah. in, the, in the single family market, so that's where it's changed. Whereas the condo market, when you're really stuck with one rental type and your competition is like every other unit in the building, it can get difficult. So we've seen a lot of investors, what they've done, they've either, either things are working out. Some of them refinance. They've refinanced once or twice because they invested for a while. And now they're in a big negative cash flow situation, but they're like, well, I did take out, you know, a, a, like a huge sum of money. So that's kind of offsetting that. Like I have to, I have to be realistic, right? They, they re-leverage. So they, they understand right. that, that part of it. But then what they've done is they've changed their strategy slightly and they've added additional units, right? So, and I think that's mm. been, been able to offset it. So it's cost some capital up front, but if depending on the property, if they're able to then all of a sudden split it up into two units, change the income number from maybe whatever the number would be, depending on the area, twenty five hundred bucks a month coming in on the one property, they, they invest some money into it, and now they're they're bringing in forty, you know, between four and forty five hundred a month. That starts to change the numbers for them, and then it kind of changes. So we we have seen a bunch of that, even though it's been more yeah, that's smart and it's harder. But I think that's been it's forced some people into that that avenue. And that's where the student problems yeah. come in for a lot of people, right? That's why a lot of people are jumping onto this student property bandwagon. And I want to jump, I want to talk to you just about population because I agree with you. I think we're at a peak. Like, I, you know, and mm-hmm. they've made some announcements, but even the announcements they made, I feel like that's just going to take the froth off the top. Like the last few years that have got just completely ridiculous, but we're yep. still, our numbers are still going to be well above the trend line from where they were prior to the immigration rule changes prior to like about 2015. Yeah, hundred percent. And people always get confused when I say this, right? Because um, the, the population doesn't go back to what it was before, right? So I'm not saying, yeah. like, no one's saying the population is going to shrink, but the rate of growth will slow, right? And that's a huge distinction. So in other words, all the people who are here in Canada will still need a place to live. Right. All that it means is we're not going to keep adding 1.2 million people a year on top of the people who are already here. So, you know, the way I'm thinking about it is that I think we're going to go by this time next year, you'll see population growth will have slowed materially. So I think by this time next year, we'll have gone from 1.2 million to something more like 900,000, maybe 800,000 year over year, which by the way, is still an it's enormous ridiculous. number <laughs> historically, like enormous, but it's just not the absolutely absurd number of 1.2 million where it's just like that number creates chaos, right? When you're trying to find rental properties for everybody. Um, and so, you know, if we slow to 800,000 and we did, we talked about earlier, you got like a pretty big boom in condo and rental construction um, as those complete, like, yeah, I think you can get to a situation where by this time next year, we'll be back to a, a rental market that is a little less frothy. So maybe we're, we're you know, we stop going up 10, 15% a year in rents and it's more like, you know, two, three, four, five percent, which is a lot more manageable. Right. Yeah. I'm just thinking like what the way I've seen it over the last, you know, few years is just, just with all this growth, 
there's been no infrastructure to keep up with it. And, you know, like, are you hearing, because I hear from some people that are Canadian, been in Canada, they love Canada. They've either, they either it, people who have immigrated to Canada for a period of time or people that have grown up in Canada. And they've got to a point, I think you write about this in some of your reports too, the way this immigration boom was done. And it feels like if, you know, there's people now that are just kind of looking around being like, I don't really know if I like the way this is being like, if, if you were going to make people anti-immigration, this is like exactly how you do it because you're seeing the strain and all, all, all the infrastructure. And like, I'm hearing from people in Canada now, and it's not just, just the immigration, it's more just the way the country's being run where they're just like, Hey, I, I really kind of am looking at some options outside of Canada to like, maybe I need to yeah. leave. And it's not like this huge number, but talking to one lawyer, he said, look, it used to be 0% of my practice, like zero. He goes, now it's between five and 10% that I'm helping people kind of structure things it. to leave Canada. So I, I don't know, like, are you hearing that in your circles a little I'm bit too? I am a hundred percent hearing that. I a hundred percent am hearing that too. So I'm in complete agreement. I think so just to unpack it for the listeners, I think um, one of the dangers is that um, we, you know, we, we like Canadians aren't good at understanding the, the, the nuances between the various programs related to immigration, right? And so for them, everything's immigration, mm -hmm. right? So for example, the feds target almost 500,000 permanent residents. And that's generally what we think of when we talk about like immigration targets, right? But then on top of that, you have these other programs that have no caps, no restrictions whatsoever, which is temporary foreign workers, international students. And that group has added 800,000 in the last year. That's where all the stress has come from. Now, for the average Canadian, they don't understand the nuances between non-permanent resident, permanent resident, the various programs. To them, it's just all immigration and it's just too much. And they're not wrong, right? It is too much. And so... Um, my point all along has been that what we're doing right now is we're risking kind of losing confidence in the integrity of the system. And, and it's something that we need to protect because that has been one of Canada's kind of superpowers for decades is that we do attract the best and the brightest and we're a welcoming society. And if you want to come here and work hard, you are welcome and you'll be part of the, you know, we'll, and, and that's been an amazing thing. And now we're to the point where people are rightfully angry, but they're not sure where to direct that anger because like they can't get a doctor's appointment and you know, they, the, the, the waiting room in the ER is jammed up and there's not enough infrastructure and they can't get rental housing for their kids. And it's like, they just, they just know that something's broken. And, um, and, and that's really what it is. It's the non-permanent resident cohort. And that's what needs to get tightened. And the feds have finally recognized that this is an issue and they, they've they now started to take concrete actions. The first being that they're reducing the number of international student visas by 35% next year. Uh, but that's nationally. And what they've done is they've implemented per capita caps for each province. And so what it means for Ontario is our international student visas will go down by 50% next year, which is a huge drop. And, and that's only starting to retrace some of the crazy boom we've seen in the last couple of years. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting time, but, but you're right. The, the average Canadian is looking at this and just being like, man, what the, like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. Right now? You know, get me out of here. Yeah. It's, it, it, you know, it's, we just, I mean, with that many people no infrastructure built and not even housing, like, I mean, anything, no ro extra roads, no extra hospitals, yeah. no extra schools, right, no totally. extra anything. What, um, man, I lost my train of thought. Oh yeah. The student, the student rentals. Um, because so you hear that number and it scares some people, the top line number, but it feels like to me, all the major schools with real program, I mean, I say real programs loosely now because I just, so many universities even made, you know, major universities have added all these degrees that are like just random things for, you know, to, to oh, drive yeah. income. But, but I mean, the, you know, those schools though, I don't feel like they're, they're going to be impacted much. I feel like it's these other, the ones that are popping up in the strip, like, cause we've joked just so you know, when this started, this was a few years ago, we're like, guys, this is crazy. We have a training room in our office. We can fit 50 people in there. They were building a new rental, uh, rental apartment about two, two, uh, two blocks from us. We're like, holy cow, we can rent out units there. We can put people in the, our classroom here. We can enroll 50 students. We were thinking of doing the math. We're like, this is a great second business for us. And we were joking about it totally. when we looked at this five years ago. And then and then we're like, holy crap, everyone's copying our idea. They're opening up these schools and all these strip malls. Are yeah, like, you know, totally. 
ABC Tom schools. and Nick's career college. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, yeah. You know, vocational but, college. Like you're right. right. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. But that's like that's insane. Like that's you know. This, but I think oh, it's 100 percent insane. Yeah. But I think that's what's good. That's what they're going after with this change. It feels like that, you know. But I don't think that that reduction in in students is going to impact those major. Like if you look at Mac and Western and Queens and and uh, Laurier, yeah. you know, I don't feel like those schools are going to be impacted much. Okay, so for the most part, you're right. So the the what's caused the issue is the colleges. 100 percent it's the colleges yeah. so universities have international students as well and they they certainly charge them more and 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 that's been a you know growing part of their student body for years but if you look at the growth in the last few years it's it's overwhelmingly been colleges and in particular it's been these private public partnerships so if you're a college you can partner with a for-profit entity and license your degree granting capabilities to them and then they can take on the responsibility of recruiting. And other. so, for example, like all of the colleges in Southern Ontario, even if you're like, um, I mean, what's the one that's down, um, like down around Windsor, there's uh, like Lampton. Okay. So like, that's a good example. Lampton's got a campus in Toronto, right? Northern college. Like what the hell is Northern college? It used to be college. It was specifically was across Northern Ontario. had like, you know, a couple, couple thousand students. They've got a campus in Toronto with like 15,000 international students. Okay. Yeah. All of those are for-profit entities. And so what the colleges do is they degree the, they, or they, they grant their degree granting capabilities. They're in theory supposed to be responsible for ensuring the quality of the delivery and all this stuff, whether they do or not, it's an open discussion. Um, but at the end of the day, like, so the college takes a, a, a cut of the tuition. They charge these kids five times what they charge Canadian kids. The college takes a cut. The, the for-profit entity keeps a bunch of it. But, but in where, where things go crazy is like, now you've got incentives on the part, part of these for-profit entities to send recruiters over to wherever, a lot of them coming from India, and make all these wild promises to people about what they're going to get when they come here, right? Because they don't have the same reputational risk that the public colleges have. And that's what they're going to clamp down on. And they should be clamping down on it. That is an insane program. And, and, and they've been able to, you know put hundreds of thousands of students into the Canadian population with no regards whatsoever for the local rental market, all while basically selling fast track citizenship at the expense of low income Canadians. It's, it's absolutely bullshit. And it's, it's long overdue that they clamp down on that. Our, our, uh, one our marketing manager immigrated from India. I don't know how long ago, four or five years ago. Um, so he's told us about the recruiting industry in India. And he's oh, like, yeah. guys, you have no idea. He goes like, yeah, they're getting paid from the colleges here for sending people. But he goes over there. There's all these different incentives. There's this underhand, like, you know, because some families are trying to bump their kids up to the top of the list. So yeah. they'll pay them extra. He goes, it's Absolutely. huge money over there, too. He goes, that industry is just and, and combined. It's what's caused. Yeah. Like now, you're, you know, and we're seeing the impacts of it here with just people sleeping on, you know, four people in one room, sleeping on mattresses and floors and stuff. Like it's, it's or just under a damn right? bridge. Like it's, it, yeah, we've taken yeah, it. Yeah. You know, I want to be really clear. Like I'm not, I'm not portraying international students as being the, the cause here. They're victims as well. They've been mm -hmm. misled and they're being horribly treated. Right. But if you think about the incentive as well, because we had such a tight labor market for the longest time, these same recruiters are getting kickbacks from the businesses for bringing in labor. I mean, oh, I'm telling you, this was such that. a lucrative. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. This is a super lucrative industry. And and again, it comes down to when you boil it right down, we are allowing for-profit entities to sell fast-track Canadian citizenships by making false representations to these vulnerable kids over in India yeah. that are just looking for a better life. Yeah, that's I mean, it's a horrible system. Yeah, and it's the thing that blew me away. We basically outsourced our immigration program to these schools because the government, yeah. they, there's like really no cap on it. My understanding is if I, and if someone called me out on this, because I, I said this before in a podcast and someone online, some comments someplace said, that's not actually true. But then we looked it up and I felt like it was, and I'm going to butcher it again, but I feel like once they have an acceptance from a school here, they, they like almost, don't they automatically get the V? I guess it's not automatic yeah. if there's something. No, that's hundred percent right. Oh, okay. No. So the way the system is set up is the, the provinces are responsible for granting the student visas. And the, the agreement with Ottawa is once the provinces have granted it, the feds effectively rubber stamp it. And so you're, you're absolutely right. This is an issue at both the provincial and the federal level. Both have dropped the ball here. And now both are coming back and trying to, trying to tighten things up. So, 
I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a real, it's a real mess, man. Like it's, I know um, what they're doing. It's ugly. They're trying to make up for the 80 million they spent on that stupid app and they're trying to get it this way. They're trying to, they're trying to refill their bank account. The 80 million. <laughs> get everybody's could... eye off the ball. <laughs> what was it that came yeah, out totally. yesterday? They, 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 they're like, we, the, 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 uh, the report said they couldn't even figure out how much it actually costs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They said that the, the record keeping was so bad. I mean, this is what we're dealing with, man. These are elective officials. It just, it gives you so little confidence in what's going on with our government right but now. Dude, it but, is so gross. So you get uh, the receipt, you put it in an envelope, you put it in an envelope and add them up later, or you put it in a spreadsheet. Like, I mean, how hard yeah. is this? this is how like... hard is it to keep track of your, con your subcontractors? It's crazy. Um, but hold on, let me just close this circle because there is one thing that I think everybody's missing in this discussion. Uh, and, and I don't know how this gets resolved, but right now we have about 2.2 million non-permanent residents in Canada, of which, I don't know, a million are students, okay? Now, remember, the selling point of coming to Canada is that you get fast-tracked for permanent residency, right? If you come here on a student visa. This is how it was sold. Now, unless Ottawa dramatically ramps up the PR targets, the permanent residency targets, I don't know how all these kids who are here are going to get PR, like they won't, right? Like think about it this way, Tom. Or Nick, like if you, if you, if the feds just wanted to hit their call it five hundred thousand target for PR, yeah. they could do that by just integrating the, the, the people who are already here as non permanent residents, and we can hit those PR targets for the next four to five years without adding a single person to the population. That's how many non permanent residents are here. Now, my concern is you have a million people who are here students were, were told, if you come here, you can fast track citizenship. This is the dream. Then you can bring your, your family here and all this stuff. Right. And the family's back at home in many cases of like mortgaged the house and pooled their savings. And like, let's do everything we can to send our kid here. Um, how, how pissed off would you be if then you find out that actually you're not going to get your PR because there's no way that we can give everybody PR because we've, we've admitted too many non-permanent residents, right? Like we're never going to, we're never going to hit those PR targets. To me, that that's that's a looming issue. I don't know how you deal with the fairness around that because you get what I'm, I'm not doing a very good job explaining it. But no, you think no, you about are. how many people are here versus the actual PR targets. There will be hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of very disappointed and possibly very angry students here when they realize that those dreams aren't going to come true. But won't they just change? Like in the you know every time they make they screw up, they just change the rules. So won't they just? And I mean, I, I'm not saying this with certainty, of course. But yep. they'll just change the work permits, allow them to stay here a little bit. They're like, oh, okay, we'll just let you stay here longer and then we'll figure it out. And then they'll just drag it on for longer. Yeah, they I, could do that. Because I agree I agree with you. I'm like, this is a shift. But they're, they're, they're not permanent residents then. They're still not permanent residents. Yeah. So they can't bring their families here. You know what I mean? They're, so, yeah. so to me, they like, can't buy, they can't you're buy, in a bit of a You can't buy here. either. And they can't buy housing for themselves either because you right. can't get a mortgage, right? Right. So you're in a real pickle here. Like, um, what, what's the solution? Like you look at the, the politics right now are in immigration. The last thing that Canadians want to see is the, the official immigration targets raised, right? That's not going to fly. Um, not, unfortunately, not the, the current government has burnt that bridge for us. Um, and so your only other option then would be if they're going to do that is then keep the permanent resident targets constant and integrate a lot of the non-permanent residents that are already here use them like use those yeah. permanent resident slots for those people but you think about what that does for population growth it drops to basically yeah. zero because you're not bringing new people here we're just taking the people who are already here and we're slotting them into the pr yeah. slots i don't know how they resolve this it's a pickle man i think you're gonna have a couple of years where you know once we're you know maybe go 25 26 27 it would be an interesting conundrum. I don't know how the feds will handle all this. We've really screwed up immigration in Canada. We really screwed it up. I, yeah, I thought we had a great system before. I, I really did. Like I thought I, until I two years we ago, we did. Yeah, it's been so recent. Like it's just exploded in two years, right? It's gone so crazy, and now I don't know how they put but this we back without a lot of people being disappointed. But if we don't have population growth for a period of time, because we had this spike and it evens out to a, a relatively normal level or whatever we call normal these days. That's not such a bad thing. I, I I don't know if they'll do it, but but do you know what I mean? Like if they do integrate them, yeah, it wouldn't be horrible. Residency. Yep. 
Yeah. Right. Cause I know that's, I, but the thing is like, they've tried to grow the economy through population growth before and it failed. And I don't know why they're like thinking that it works again. Like I just, well, that's a great point actually, Nick, that's a really good point. Cause right now all of the growth in the Canadian economy is due to population growth. If you look at GDP on a per capita basis, it's declining. Yes. Right. So you're right. This creates a pickle for the government. If they're going to do that, then they're effectively going to have to engineer a recession. Right. Because, you know, if you're not bringing in, 3% population growth every year, then where's your GDP growth going to come from? Yeah, because when I talk to people on the streets, because we were talking earlier about, you know, like the employment numbers really aren't down and stuff. But when I talk to business owners, everyone's feeling squeezed. Like, and I, I know the employment numbers have, haven't changed that much. And, you know, I don't know if it's because it's people are doing different types of employment, if part-time versus full-time or second, second jobs, or whatever the case may be. But everyone's feeling squeezed. And I know people are like, even contractors are like, man, I couldn't find labor before um, to your point about maybe people are dropping prices. Cause he goes, well, now I have people that were working in other companies calling me saying, Hey, do you have any, any work? You know, can I do some stuff? So there's like, it's, it's mm -hmm. like the economy on the streets at least is clearly slowing down from like everyone I, I talk to, even though the numbers that, you know, the official government numbers are kind of showing, oh, maybe it's not slowing so much. I'm like, I don't know, man, everyone I talk to is like, what the hell's going on? And this is, this is painful. Yeah, but that's fair. I think also, you know, I can imagine that your circle skews heavily towards real estate. Um, uh, is that fair? Yeah. Like, cause I, I can totally believe that if you're in the construction trades, like, yeah, that's going to be, You've probably seen a slowdown for financial a few sector now. Two, investment, financial yeah. sector two, you know, the financial okay. sector, which, which is, which is on the investing side. So kind of, you know, there's less yeah. money floating around for people to be doing that type of stuff. So yeah, that makes yeah. sense. I, I agree with you though. I, I think that, you know, my view has been that we probably are going to end up in a recession this year. And, you know, when I look at what's being priced in around rate cuts, right? So right now, when you get into discussion about interest rates right now, um, markets are expecting kind of three interest rate cuts starting in, in June in Canada. That's not really a lot, right? I mean, that's not really going to move the needle for affordability. I think if I was to bet the over or the under on that, you know, three rate cut, I, I think it's going to be more than that because I think to your point, you know, you roll this forward a few more months, I think it's going to be pretty clear the economy is slowing pretty hard. These interest rates just do not work. In fact, I had a crazy chart. So, you know, it's on my Twitter feed if people want to look it up, but you look at corporate bankruptcies in Canada right now. That chart is unbelievable. We are setting records for corporate bankruptcies every month. I mean, it looks like a hockey stick. It's just a flat bottom and then it just spikes in the last, really last six months. Now, there's only so you can only go for so long where you've got spiking corporate bankruptcies before it starts to show up with a weak labor market. Like somebody's losing their job somewhere. If corporate bankruptcies are spiking, like people have to be losing their job somewhere. So you give this time, I think this will come to the surface. So my point would be that I think it's there's a decent chance that we're going to be in recession kind of come mid year or, or maybe even maybe even sooner. And um, you know, you start to see job losses. And then at that point, that's probably going to give the bank can a little more cover to start cutting rates more yeah. aggressively. So I wouldn't be shocked if we end up with like five rate cuts this year. Let, let right? If I'm wrong on that, it's going to be a problem because three rate cuts isn't really going to move the needle for affordability at all. Let me show you something quick on, uh, can you, you can see this chart here? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm curious what you, what you think of this. So, so, okay. So on your part about rate cuts, I, yeah, I, it makes sense. I know CIBC came out um, at one point recently they, and they felt even one of those rate cuts might not, might have to be a half point. Cause they, even they're yep. thinking like that, you know, the three small rate cuts, it just might not cut it. But this is, mm -hmm. this is the type of stuff, we, uh, you know, how we're kind of psycho about this stuff, uh, real rates and M2 growth and stuff like that. And if we got to talk, I mean, we kind of got to talk about that before, before I let you go for sure. Of course. Of course. Like, what, yeah, I'd but, be disappointed if you didn't talk about it. <laughs> but, but look, but like when real rates are like this, it's like with this mm -hmm. much debt in the system, it's Some not more. even to me about it for, cause I, I, when I read certain things on Twitter, like there's, you know, in the mortgage world and, and real estate world, everyone's always talking about, well, like they have to, because the real estate market is doing, and I'm like, guys, there's bigger forces at play than just like the real estate or mortgage market. And I know in Canada, those are massive forces and those matter, but just the amount of debt and the government debt in the system and stuff, yeah. they have real rates this high. They can't maintain this for a period of time because things just break, don't they? I, I totally agree with you. hundred percent. I agree with you. I think it's, you know, so 
I've always had the view that it's less important how high interest rates go, and it's much more important how long they stay at higher levels. So for example, if interest rates in Canada, let's say mortgage rates were to spike to 12% for a year, right? That's a lot less kind of damaging than 5% or 6% mortgage rates for three or four years. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because this gets back to what we talked about earlier. Like people in Canada are really resourceful at treading water for a time. Right. And I talked when I talked to insolvency trustees, the one thing they always tell me is like people will come into their office and they're like, these guys are dead in the water. Their finances are a disaster. They need to file today. And they say those people will walk out their office and they'll come back a year later. And they're like, how did you even like, how did you make that work for a year? Right. But Canadians are very resourceful at just treading water. I think that's, I think we're right in that period right now where Canadians have are feeling the pinch, but treading water and it's not showing up in the delinquency data. It's not showing up in charge off to the banks, um, but it's coming. But where I think that you're seeing it more is on the business sector. Can I share my screen? Am I uh, able to or no? Well, well maybe I, think, I can. Can I? You should be able to. Let me just allow you to, if you okay, can. Okay. Let me. Uh, yeah. You should be able to. Okay. Can you see this uh, this this thing I'm working on right here? Yep. Yeah. So this is the note that I'm sending out um, today to the edge analytics clients. But look, look at this chart, dude. Monthly corporate bankruptcies. I mean, wow. like what a chart. Like this is crazy. So this is going back to 1990. So it's, it's a high. It's it's matching the highest ever. Or it's just over. It's not the highest like, ever. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's not the highest ever. So. Um, you just can't tell me that these rates aren't hurting the economy. It's just, you know, we're at, I think we're at a point where there's just been so much buffer from the pandemic related savings that it's masking the, the pain on the consumer side, but it's just, it's just a matter. It's just time is all yeah. that's going to take. And I think you, know, you roll this forward three, six months, I think it's gonna be really clear that we've got problems in the labor market. And then that's going to, I think really cause a, a tone change from the bank of Canada. That's my, that's where I'm at on that. I, I just don't, I don't think three cuts are going to do it. Um, Look, let's hope, you know, let's hope, hope we're not wrong on that because, you know, if we're here a year from now and rates are still this high, that's um, that's going to be a problem. Well, yeah, that a you know, real problem. That means just inflation came back and it, it, the whole, everything's going to be, they'll, yeah, there'll be much bigger problems than uh, people's mortgage payments on one rental property. You know, that. Yeah. that's for sure. Yeah, no good way to put it. Yeah. Hey, what, okay, so M2. I'm curious to know because you know you know because we're like this. So sometimes I, I look at this and, and and so here's a chart that we ran. This is uh, the U. This is Canada M2 versus U uh, US M2 going back to about '76, yeah. I think. Oh, cool. I don't know if you saw that one that we put up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, so the which Canadian. one? We're the red line. So we're the bottom we're, line. No, we're the blue line. No, we're, we're the top we're, line. It's one of the few things we're better at the US than at. at. We can. Oh wow. We okay. we grow, we we print more we grow money, our money faster. Yeah. So I, I we wow. look at this stuff. And like, sometimes I look at this and I'm like, well, isn't this a major underlying problem when it comes to the affordability and like the prices of things? And I know it's like, you can argue chicken and egg because like, if you put low rates, then the, and the growth goes faster because people borrow to buy real estate yeah. versus, you know, like I get it. So that's why like we're torn with it as well. But I'm like, isn't one of the core underlying problems of what we're seeing in, in the, what we saw in the real estate market and affordability is the fact that we're just just printing more money and devaluing our monetary base so that the sticker price of things, so that asset prices end up going up. People who own yep. assets benefit from it. People who don't own assets can't keep up because incomes don't grow at the same rate. And we're just wiping out the middle class and we're creating the two-tier system. And it is what it is. And until we change that type of policy, we can't really get away from that in a meaningful way. Yeah, I think you're no question that what we've seen in the last, well, really since the financial crisis, when they embarked on kind of novel monetary policy. Um, yeah, free money. Uh, it, <laughs> yeah, and the whole QE, and it's clearly been inf highly inflationary for assets, right? And, um, and it kind of makes sense why it would be because, you know, a lot of the policies that they were, were that, that they were targeting was to drive interest rates on debt instruments lower, right? Well, if you understand how that works, if you drive in the rates lower, then then the existing debt instruments become more, more valuable, right? If you're holding a bond that you, yields eight percent, but now because the the Fed and the bank can't have driven interest rates down to two percent, well, you're sitting on a really valuable bond because it's paying you eight percent, and then the other ones are only paying you two. So of course it would goose 
asset values. And that's, that's true for, you know, real estate as well. If you were sitting on a, uh, a, you know, a, a rental property, um, when it, when mortgage rates were 8%, it was valued at one level, but when mortgage rates dropped to 2%, well, now that, that stream of cash flow is much more valuable. The asset is much more valuable. And so no question that's, that's been a major driver of kind of the, the boom we've seen in, in asset values, man. I don't, when it comes to, so the way I think about with money supply growth is like, um, all else equal. If you had a perfectly closed economy with no productivity gains, if you saw a 10% increase in the monetary base, you'd see prices rise 10%, more or less. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the reality is we do get productivity gains, right? And, and that's tough to capture, right? So let's say that that you you could have the monetary base growing by 3 or 4%, and it, and it doesn't affect pricing, potentially, because we have so many productivity-enhancing you know, technologies that it's hard to capture on the data. So for example, like you and I are talking on zoom right now, 10 years ago, we couldn't do this. I'd have to get in my car and drive down and, and we'd have to get somebody to record it with some old, you know, sure. I mean, like it's, yeah. it's a totally different thing. And, and, and how do you capture that? The fact that we just saved hundreds of dollars by being able to do this versus me getting in the car and driving this, you know what I mean? Like that's hard to capture. And so, yeah. so what I think about is like, if the monetary base is growing 10%, um, Maybe you get headline CPI that's whatever, five, six percent. Uh, but when you're dealing with scarce assets like real estate and prime location, right? That's gonna rise by 10% because there's no productivity growth that can that can make more real estate in, in prime locations. So yeah, I think you're right. Assets that are scarce will tend to rise more or less in line with the mon- growth in the monetary base. Um, and other necessities that, that that can be made more cheaply, more effectively because of productivity gains will not, right? Mm-hmm. So you get a, get a situation where CPI is rising at one level, but asset holders are seeing their, you know, their assets growing much more than that. Mm-hmm. Does that does that kind of make sense? Yeah, no, I think it makes a lot of sense. And I, I was I was curious as to your thoughts because I know we've kind of didn't, never, never really talked about it. And it aligns with something that hit me when I was uh, speaking to Jeff Booth once because, he, you know, his... Have you read The Price of Tomorrow by Jeff Booth, that book? I, I know the premise. I have not read it, but yeah. Okay. So, yeah but he's a big deflationary type guy. Yeah. yeah, because technology, to your point, technology gives you yeah. productivity gains and brings everything down to the marginal cost of production, essentially. So yes. they have to, so they to offset that because of the way the financial system is structured, they have to cre- create more inflation, create inflation, print more money, yes. because they can't have, have the deflation in things. And, yes. and then that money just goes to these these, like you said, good assets, you know, like yeah. it doesn't have to be real estate. Assets you know? that can't be created easily through productivity yeah. gains. Yeah, yeah. Good assets. And, and you know, that's, yeah. yeah. So, so it aligns with that. And it, it didn't, it, it hit me once. It was when he was talking about oil specifically. He's like, just think about oil, all the new technology we have for oil. Why yeah. is the price of oil where it is now? It's, it's much easier for us to extract oil. We have all this other stuff. But we yet the price is going up because they have to, and this is just the one that hit me. I mean, you can, you know, different people at different times, but but they they can't have the price of it going down, so they have to increase it, and they have to kind of fight. They have to use inflation to offset those deflationary forces or those productivity gains, like you're talking about. So yeah, that's so, so that's interesting. It kind of aligns with what we're thinking. The, the 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 I always just wonder. I'm like, am I being biased because I see it in real estate? So like. You know, obviously the growth is happening because of low rates. So then people are borrowing more, which then creates more money. Yeah. And, you know, just kind yeah. of like the, the no, it's true. There way, isn't right? a thing. Yeah, it's it's tough to disaggregate all that. I don't. I man, I I don't have a strong view on that. But but I I do think you know set, set, taking a step back and just the inflation discussion more broadly. I think. I, I'm less I'm less focused on like M2 and what they have to do there. And like from a higher level, I would view it in kind of through, through this lens, which is that you, you look at all debt in Canada, various levels of government, private sector, corporations, um, and you compare it to GDP. We're like the fourth most indebted country among all the developed and developing countries. I See, mean, we we're never, way we up can- there. We can never be number one in anything, though. Like, if we're going to do it, right. we should do it right. Why stop at four? You know what I mean? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but like, you know, how, how do you how do you grow your way out of a debt problem like that? Like, to me, the answer is going to going to involve that you need to let inflation run a little bit hot to inflate yeah. away the value of the debt. And this is what they did after World War II in a lot of developed countries, and and we kind of are coming out of a, a like a war time 
spending boom coming out of COVID. And, and I think the response from the government is going to be similar. So I'm with you. I actually think we're going to see an inflationary environment for a number of years that um, that is going to probably punish savers and, well, again, is going to reward asset holders because they have to inflate away the value of that debt. Okay. Yeah. I just didn't know for like, because I, I always try to, whenever I'm looking at something like, what am I missing? So I always like, I, 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 you know, value different points of view and stuff. So that's, that's why I'm curious. Cause one of the things. It's like, two sides of the same coin. I'm with you on that. It's two sides yeah. of the same coin. We're both looking at the same thing. And, and I think at the end of the day, the answer comes down to you. They're, they're probably going to have to let inflation run hot, you know? Yeah. Here's what ticks me off a little bit. And I'm, I'm curious, which is, then I know we got to wrap up. So I'm just, when, you know, they talk about inequality, the government kind of talks this good game. But when you look at the way the system is structured, if I was a lower, let's call it a new immigrant. We're talking about immigration. So I come to Canada. I'm working my ass off. I'm trying to save some money because the house that I see that I want now is whatever, $600,000. It's outside of Toronto someplace. Let's call it 600 grand. So I'm saving because I'm saving up for my down payment. I want to be able to buy this house and I'm working and you know I'm going to save after a few years. And then after those few years, that asset price is because of, this, because of the things we we're just talking about keeps kind of growing and it grows faster than I can save because of the way the system's structured. And it it's, it doesn't allow people to move up the ladder. And then we get this, mm. gro- you know, because people talk about the growing inequality and there's the rich and the poor and stuff. I'm like, well, yeah, mm. the, it's that's a problem. But the way the system's structured, it's, cre- it's, it's contributing to the problem and it doesn't allow people because, you know, there's certain people, there's certain rich people don't want to work and they're lazy, whatever. That's, that's one thing. And people might hate me for saying that, but there's certain poor people probably in the same boat and they don't want to provide effort to change their situation. But there's others that are, and they're trying to make a yeah. difference. And they're trying to provide value to people. And I think it, it, where I get ticked off is I'm like, those people should be able to move up the way they want to move up because they're providing the value into the society, into the economy. And this is type of things preventing them to. And so I feel it contributes to other problems in society, not just housing prices in general. Yeah, man, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> Sorry to Yeah, like you. amen. Like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think you're right. The system is, the system is set up and it's, I don't have an answer for that. Like your, your observations are bang on. I don't know how, I mean, right now it's different. If you're a saver, you're finally being rewarded with some positive, you know, real, real, real savings and your asset value, depending on what you're looking at, like real estate. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, if you were a saver, you've done all right in the last little while, but, but, but up until say the last year or year and a half, you're right. It's been punitive. Like if you're trying to get into this market, it's just like, it's just running away on you. Um, I don't know what the answer is there. It's uh, yeah. We're kind of getting to the point. And, and this is not, I, see, this is offensive to Canadians because we know what we know, right? And, and our, what, we, what we live is our experience. And it's hard to visualize what, what it's like when you're you know, looking at other areas. But there are parts of the world where the reality is that, um, you know, home ownership rates are much lower. Um, the, the availability, it's kind of like if you don't, it's brutal to say, but like if you don't have family that are already in the real estate market, it just gets, it gets really hard yeah. to get in. And that's like, that's a lot of parts of Europe, for example, it's real home ownership is way out of reach. I don't love that. I don't think that needs to be our, our kind of, you know, <laughs> where we end up here in Canada, because we, we are blessed with an abundance of land. And if we can kind of get our shit together and figure out how to, how to move the ball forward, with regards to bringing more supply, then that doesn't have to be the future, but that seems to be kind of where we're trying to get to, yeah. right? Yeah. Which is a what, sad state of affairs. What got you into this? Like, it, it's it's so, I I really value people, being able to have conversations like this with people like you and, and, and the information that you put out regularly, kind of dissecting different segments, because it just gives such perspective on different things. How did you start, like what interested you to start doing this? Yeah, it was, it was exactly that. It was an interest. So I was, um, you know, I, I have, uh, my background is loosely in economics, but more kind of the human geography side of things, which is population and, and economics and was teaching at a college, actually teaching at Georgian college and, um, very much enjoyed it, but had a public facing website, um, like a blog. It's going back like 2010, 2011. And, um, you know, through the course of time, just ended up building a pretty big, distribution and kind of subscriber list, um, and then realized that most of my subscribers were big institutions and then started getting requests to do consulting and reports. And I thought, geez, there's probably a way to turn this into a business. And so 2013 
started my main company, which is North Cove Advisors. And I work with you know, a lot of kind of top tier global asset managers, um, he, both here in Canada and abroad. So pension funds, mutual fund companies, endowments, sovereign wealth funds, like a lot of big pools of capital. And for them, I'm tra- tracking things like Canadian credit, um, broad macro trends. And, and then it, an offshoot of that was what I'm doing with edge analytics, which is how I know you guys, right? So taking that, those same concepts, making it a little more accessible to someone who's not a financial practitioner, but is more of a kind of a practical person that's, you know, working in the real estate space like yourselves and trying to take some of those concepts to still down, make it more accessible and, um, you know, keep you guys in the loops too. So yeah, that's, man. that's, that's where it is. It's awesome. Yeah, we value it. And for anyone that's not following you on Twitter already, they, they should be. If they're on Twitter and they're looking for this type of info, for sure, they should they should be. It's it's just your name, isn't it? Yep. At Ben Rabideau. Yep. And then otherwise, uh, if you're a real estate practitioner, and, and it gets tricky, you can't sign up with a Gmail, right? But but you can sign up for a free month at edgeanalytics.ca. You check out what we do. We've got infographics on there for people who want to, you know, send stuff out to client newsletters and stuff like that. Um, then we do a couple reports uh, a month and subscriber conference calls and stuff like that. So edgeanalytics.ca, uh, you can sign up for a free month there. And then otherwise, um, yeah, Ben Rabideau on Twitter. Yeah. Cool, man. I always appreciate taking the time. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's insightful speaking to you. So I appreciate it. No, my pleasure. It's great catching up. Thanks, man. Thank you. Hey, thanks for tuning in. You can find every new episode of the Your Life, Your Term show on all the major streaming platforms. So Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. And if you'd like to get free copies of some of the books that we've put together, like these right here, or some of the reports that we've put together, like these right here, you can find all of those at www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's it for now. Until next time, your life, your terms. Your life, your terms.